Hi, good day, everyone. Welcome to the Nikis 2022 uh, conference. Um, um, our first speaker for the HPC hardware, for the HPC technologies um, session will be Chris Pagano. Chris has been with Dell Technologies for a while, and he is well-versed in the HPC uh, environment with many years of experience. Over to you, Chris, you may start. So I'll set up my slides. Uh, oh, well, a warm welcome from the winter side of the world. So I'll be covering some, some uh, let's say, act, items of what we see from the Dell Technologies side. Um, well, we are, we've been in the HPC market quite some while from small to recently really large systems like uh, the, the biggest and the fastest machine in commercial HPC, which is ENI, which is doing research in um, oil and gas uh, with, a, with a big Dell system at the moment. And it's actually higher up in the top 500 than our other big machine is the Tech Frontier machine. So we've done some observations and we've seen that the landscape of HPC is changing. It's no longer a general purpose area. We're doing more things. We're doing, uh, let's say, other things with, with, with our HPC stuff. And for some reason, my slide is not showing. Interesting. So it was a very nice slide containing information about how do we do HPC these days? It's siloed. We have an, a, an HPC system that does is on its own, is, uh, has its own ecosystem. Then we have AI, we have data analytics, we have some Kubernetes containerized platforms which are all in their own environment. And the goal that we're looking at and, and what we're tr seeing in trend is that this is going to go merge into a single system basically where we see that the, a single stack will enable working in all these different kind of uh, ecosystems. And one of those tools that we actually are developing within Dell Technologies is called Omnia. Um, if you want to know more about it, I'll, because I don't have time to explain it in 20 minutes, it's going to take quite some longer time. But it's an interesting, uh, let's say, evolution of how technology goes forward and how technologies are merging into the same and that Things that looked like a separate are actually now merging into the same ecosystem and calling it HPC, call it AI, call it data analytics, it all is a workload which runs on a similar kind of conceptual platform. And then we, we step over into what we see as in node trends, what our systems are looking at. And traditionally, we've got these four nodes into you. A lot of people have a similar density of, uh, let's say, server uh, lines, which, but we are seeing that this is actually being challenged these days. Looking at the history, it was easy to cool. The, the early dense platforms were easy to cool, was not that hard. Uh, it, the power supplies was, was only 1.4 kilowatts for four nodes, which was reasonably doable. But if you look at the current generations, where we're looking at the, uh, the, the higher range and what we uh, are deploying now, we're looking at systems which are have CPUs, which actually have a TDP, which can no longer be air cooled. We need uh, liquid cooling. And looking at the future, we only see it getting worse, basically. So power, uh, the TDP ranges are going so much higher than we, we are used to. And that's pushing our limits as a uh, system integrator, system developer. And we're driven by our technology partners, AMD, Intel, and whoever comes next to move along. And the accelerators don't make it easy because that's actually even making it worse. And uh, putting this in a simple graph, our CPU TDPs are going up dramatically. And also, another concern is that the complexity of the motherboard is also becoming a very interesting challenge we, because our CPUs are getting so much pins on, on them and our memory channels are expanding. Um, one of the uh, technology partners is talking about going to 24 DIMMs for a single uh, dual socket system. That's a lot of space that's going to be occupied and we see that we might not be able to 
put this into a dense dual socket platform anymore. So maybe it's time to go to a single socket because of we got we get huge amounts of cores in a single socket, and we uh, have to avoid in in that way we can avoid numa issues and with new sockets becoming so large and all the let's say just physically not possible anymore and also the tdp is climbing enormously this also is a challenge and um, at a certain point in time you there's not enough let's say physical aspects that you can allow your system to be cooled and looking at high performance networking well the landscape is not changing that fast it's incremental changes uh, we are looking at infiniband and they are uh, but there are some new ones on the rise is low latency ethernet and some of those um, we're looking at and following is our own switches of course but uh, also the guys from rockport which have a very interesting concept uh, and cornelis networks is still on the map and they are have a very good roadmap going forward and a very good software ecosystem um, the topologies themselves are not changing dramatically. We see mostly in most clusters, fat trees, uh, the largest systems because of the number of ports required are moving to Dragonfly Plus or Megafly. Depends on how you name it, but it's basically the same. Looking at the top 500 list currently, it's about 50-50 split between Ethernet and Infiniment. We do have to admit that some of that is being, um, let's say, uh, biased by a lot of installations which are not really IB, uh, not really HPC, because there's a lot of cloud systems in the top 500, uh, let's say, in the lower regions. So I'm having a convers let's say, a look at how I InfiniBand was. In 2012, we had only 16 cores. 56 gigabits per second was more than good enough. 1.3 microseconds late latency. Yeah, no worries. But these days we're looking at 128 cores and more per node. And we need that HDR, we need that 200 gigabits. And the latency has not changed that much. So there's also a fact about message rate. Because we are, are we're loading more cores, we need more communication to be done. And this is a, conf uh, let's say a, com a comparison between uh, message rates over time and the bandwidth and the latency, how it's changed over time. Actually our latency has improved and then got a little bit worse, but got improved again. Connecting seven, the next generation will be interesting. I'll still, I don't have actual numbers from it, but as you can see, the, the message rate has gone up dramatically. That's what we need because of the many cores that we put in systems. So the next step would be composability. And that's what the future is about. How can we compose systems? Well, basically uh, there was talk about CXL, there was talk about Gen Z. Uh, Gen Z has been rolled up into CXL, so all communicates about cross uh, PCI Express. So Intel and AMD, AMD has its own, brand, let's say, brand of um, co co coherent communication, but that also uses the PCI Express fabric to, to communicate. So what can we do today? It's just server attached storage, traditional storage, network we can do some composability on the network side of things and gpus with our gpu direct and other kind of uh, technology and pci switching uh there's a, a company that we uh, sometimes work with is called liquid uh, liqid and they have a, a way of switching these gpus over a fabric but what are we wanting that we what do we need the next step. So we should need that we can actually compose DRAM, do memory uh, allocations and, and combine them. And uh, also for storage class memory, uh, obtain class or whatever comes next of a vendor that has to do it. And the GPUs, whatever form of factor that we have, and, the, and also the smart mix where the DPUs are uh, an upcoming thing. And we see that that has actually a need for this composability that you can logically connect devices without having the local resources or having, for instance, a uh, device which has only 
accelerators of various types, which then you can allocate to systems on demand or even from a scheduler point of view. So this is kind of a, an overview of, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but the most important part is that Gen Z now has merged with CXL. They have taken over all the uh, uh, requirements and the uh, specs and Gen Z is becoming part of CXL basically. So CXL will be able to communicate outside the box. It was designed as inside the, the, the system, uh, but with the merge of the two technologies, going forward, it will allow us to do rack level uh, composability, basically, and even across racks over time. It all depends on, of course, the signal integrity that we can guarantee. And the end state that we want to achieve is actually just, yeah, software defined servers, basically. And then you can define, if you want a big new machine for a specific workload, then you're going to define that as a big new machine. And if you need uh, lots of uh, a big fleet of, uh, let's say, independent machines for a massively parallel system, yes, you can do it. Just it's an ecosystem and software can control it and manage it. And this can be controlled from a control plane that then can load whatever needs to be done on top. If you need a GPU, you can request a GPU. If it's available, you get it directly. If it's not, not available, you will uh, get it over time. So it's, it's, it's scheduling and um, dispatching. And th that's a practical example of what's possible now is talking about liquid basically. And that's what they do currently. And we have uh, this dynamic bare metal that we can already do with, but it's limited to, let's say, accelerators and systems. They do have a very good ecosystem, a software ecosystem to allow this, uh, let's say, building of a system from a simple uh, framework. Uh, it's not yet integrated in what we call uh, scheduling engines, but that's the future. And we see, uh, maybe Fritz can uh, uh, comment on this later, but that's what we see that will be a something that will drive this technology even further than down the line. So how does this look like? It's just a box with a command center and um, just physically connecting. We've done a proof of concept based on the MX platform, but any server could apply. It does have, it just has to have the uh, HCA to connect to the liquid box, basically. So that's a brief, let's say, overview. Uh, there's not that much I can do within 20 minutes. Uh, but is there, is there any questions? Like, give it a go. Over to you, Rick. Well, if there's no, no real questions coming down the line, um, that we can actually suspend and give you back a few minutes. I'm, I'm, I'm having a, bit, uh, a challenge. Spell them for me. Uh. I'm having a bit of a challenge. With my stop this one. Uh, yeah, I had a bit of a challenge with my Zoom application. Apology for that. Uh, Chris? I know what is. Yeah, currently they haven't, we don't have a lot of um, questions coming in. Maybe it could be late, um, but the web, the technical report will normally um, 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 
well, they will normally pose the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe something that uh, we, we, we're thinking, or maybe from my side, uh, Chris, you mentioned space um, requirements that, especially from an HPC perspective, and I think that's a typical challenge for most HPC centers also, because Correct. the bigger your rack is going to be, the more components it's going to be um, around in one node, the, the bigger your, your and size and consumption of power cooling is going to be also. And I think um, we, from an HPC perspective, would rather prefer things really coming, getting smaller, really maybe more slower taking into effect, um, that it gets smaller, but again, more slower is also dictated by size yep. to an extent. And I think also new generation go, um, um, HPC centers, hoping to look for a smaller footprint. Um, Correct, and we, we're actually investigating that uh, in, in our labs, but that's uh, some generations further down the line where we're looking at rack integrated systems, where we look at, well, it's a full, full rack you will get and where we get down the maximal, uh, let's say, density into that rack. The only challenge that we see there is that the power delivery and the power and cooling will be the, the bigger challenge because we're looking at 80 to 100 kilowatts a rack or even more. And a lot of, let's say, data centers and HPC uh, locations will find this a challenge over time. It's not only just the cooling. Cooling is solvable, but it's also the power delivery. How do you get 100 kilowatts to a single rack? That's a big cable. Yes, that is something that also we find very challenging in our environment. Uh, and so, so which lets your actual prospects of really looking for even extending the current environment or um, just narrowing the footprint itself, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a challenge that we see, but uh, let's say the trend that we see f going forward coming from our technology partners like AMD, Intel, and whoever comes next, it's going not to be going easier because we're getting, we get more cores but the size of the system will not be smaller. Uh, the only way we can get more performance per watt is basically going to accelerators where uh, the, guy, the systems like Intel, Spontevecchio, NVIDIA's cards and AMD's cards, they provide us lots of performance, but let's say the use case is different. And let's say we need to develop the ecosystem and the developers that they can make use of those systems much more and more efficient. And then the other challenge will be getting those uh, devices fed with enough data. So getting the I.O. IO right will be another one of those challenges. Okay, I think from my, that's all from my side, Chris. Uh, we haven't for, um, got any questions coming through yet. Uh, maybe Kevin, Kevin, would you like to ask a question or are you okay? Uh, I'm good, thank you. Um, I think we're running a little over time now, so perhaps it's a good place to switch. call it. No, I think yeah. we stopped at a quarter two because Christmas is 10 minutes. So oh, was it? Sorry. Yes, we mistake. started quarter past 12 to quarter 12, so we, uh, Chris got quite a bit of time. And then, um, then let me just check the time. Yes, and then uh, first we'll start. But I think if um, that uh, um, we don't have questions, and I think this is actually key or part and parcel of our own environment that I would have loved to see more questions. Uh, it's actually quite a significant topic. Mm -hmm. And at some point we might pick it up, but we've got your contact details, Chris. You know me, and you know where I live. And we know we've got your, some of the, your, your other colleagues that will also assist us in that regard. Yes. Yeah. 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 I've got Martin, uh, Martin Hilgeman always next to me for the more, let's say, technical on software side of things and the intrinsics of the system. And I work with HPC lab, with Onur's lab, with, uh, with all the guys in Austin as well directly. Yeah. 
Great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, You're it welcome. was a very interesting and significant presentation. And I think uh, Fritz will deliver something similar. And Fritz might have questions also and some additional stuff that you want to add. We're going to take maybe a, a slight five, not really a break, but I'm just going to pause technical support this presentation till about a quarter to what? I think that should be it. Um, we can pause to quarter to one. Thank you very much, Chris, and all the best for the coming holidays. If you guys will actually ever experience something, but stay safe and stay blessed on that side. <laughs> thank you. Same to you, and thank you for the time that you to gave us. Okay, then. Thank you very much, Chris. A technical support. We're gonna have a, a slight pause, and then um, till about maybe twenty um, twenty two, and then. Uh, Chris, um, Fritz, you can start loading your presentation, and when before you start, I will just do the introduction. Once again, welcome back, everyone. We are at our second uh, session for the HPC Technology Support. Our uh, next speaker will be, um, um, our next speaker is from, just introduce Fritz, Fritz Firstel, Senior Vice President of Software Development at Altair. Chris is gonna, Chris is gonna, uh, Chris presentation would be, uh, is gonna be about HPC Cloud, use cases and best practices. Um, we're going to leave the questions for later. So you might post questions as the presentation, um, um, throughout the presentation itself in the live presentation, and we will get to the present, um, um, we will get to answer those questions later after the presentation is being concluded. Over to you, Fritz, you may start. Yeah, thank you for the uh, introduction. So I can uh, move on from this slide, given uh, that every information here is uh, uh, contained in your introduction already. So just two very brief uh, slides on Altair in case you're not familiar. Altair is really a multifaceted uh, HPC software company. Uh, we have things uh, from you know core HPC to uh, uh, machine learning, uh, uh, lots of different types of angles and applications. What joins all of the efforts that we do together is really that we try to transform the customer decision making with the help of our products. Um, so if you look at uh, where we have leadership, uh, it's again a really broad spectrum. It goes from, <clears throat> excuse me, it goes from uh, all kinds of physics simulations, be that CFD, structural mechanics, uh, electrodynamic simulations. We have lots of uh, 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 data analytics, uh, um, smart uh, or uh, uh, machine learning technology, lots of uh, core HPC, and also, uh, as you can see here, cloud and hybrid computing. That's really what I'm going to focus on uh, with this talk. And uh, even there, we have a rich portfolio. Uh, so this is a list of all the products that are pertinent in this uh, context. Uh, I will be focusing on uh, these uh, five products below. Uh, well, rather, I will not talk about these products per se. What I actually will do is I will uh, walk you through a cloud adoption lifecycle. So how you would go about uh, moving from, for instance, a POC to your initial deployment to production and the uh, different things that you should have in mind as you do so. And I will do that really in the context of some use cases with uh, the companies that are listed here, plus two more, which I cannot name uh, or provide the logo for. Uh, so in total, I have nine use cases, which is quite a bit of material. So I need to uh, move fast. So let's start uh, even before the POC. So before you start your cloud journey, what is it that you should have in mind? And the key thing is really uh, be aware of your key use cases and expectations. 
we have done uh, cloud deployments with customers where they just wanted to go to cloud but didn't really figure out yet what they were looking for. It's absolutely important for a good experience that you think about beforehand, what is it really uh, the minimum that I want to accomplish, so to speak, and what are my expectations? Uh, then another thing is you should definitely look at whether cloud is already used internally. It's often the case that, for instance, in finance or customer relations and so on, there is uh, cloud usage already, although usually on a lower scale, but that might uh, mean that there are existing policies, uh, there are cloud accounts already established, billing has already been established, there are security uh, uh, requirements, networking requirements, identity management, all those things are often already fixed for you. Um, and uh, uh, so you have to be aware of those things because you just may have to fit in. Then also uh, there can be compliance requirements. Uh, they can again, again uh, talk about security or any of the other things. Uh, one thing that we often see is certified images. And uh, you know that's an area that I want to highlight uh, alongside a uh, use case. So the use case is Janssen Pharmaceuticals, which is a, a Johnson & Johnson uh, subsidiary. Uh, Janssen uh, does drug discovery. So they were the ones that uh, created the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, so really what they do is uh, science on demand and capacity at scale. They have about 20 clusters at all times in, uh, of HPC in the cloud. That's their only HPC. They only do HPC in the cloud. They do, don't do it, do it on-prem anymore. Uh, it's a truly multi-tenant environment because those clusters are very different and uh, uh, users that access one cluster must not see the work that's going on in other clusters and stuff like that. So they have about 1,500 users uh, currently are moving to use 10K uh, cores. Uh, so one of the things that was very special about them, for instance, was uh, obviously their, their products uh, need to be FDA approved. Uh, so they actually have uh, FDA compliant machine images. Uh, so everything on that machine has to be FDA approved. Uh, and that, for instance, in some cases uh, led to boot times of an instance, of a cloud instance of up to one hour. You obviously want to know that before you uh, uh, start your cloud journey because that's, that is cost, right? You're paying for that hour while the machine uh, boots up. It still is uh, you know, beneficial for them. Uh, but usually what we see is that customers uh, have requirements around, for instance, security certification. So they have to have, they have to use base images that have been scrutinized by their security department and are certified for them to use. So that's definitely one of the things uh, you should uh, keep uh, an eye on. Uh, one of the things that we do actually, uh, as we engage with customers for POCs, we send them uh, a questionnaire. Uh, this is just a snippet of it. Uh, it actually has some 70 questions. And I'm yet to see a customer that has an easy time filling out uh, that questionnaire. So usually when, when uh, people start with a cloud journey, they do not have all the answers that they need actually to, to go through a really successful uh, POC. There's lots of things you have to think about beforehand. So you have a smooth uh, POC that may only just take two or three days. Um, so otherwise, you start figuring out things as you go, and that ob obviously delays the whole process and uh, degrades the uh, experience. Next up, so as you actually do the POC, our uh, big recommendation is to take it step by step. Uh, so what I mean by this is uh, target cloud only first. Uh, so even if you if your end game is hybrid cloud, start with cloud only first, and then later wire it up to uh, uh, on-prem. And also only focus on a few key customers, a few key use cases and uh, uh, applications. Uh, one or two may be sufficient. Uh, you can always add uh, other applications later. And also, even if you want to do uh, multi-cloud, start with a single cloud. <clears throat> And uh, when, you, when you want to do storage in the cloud uh, or you want to, want to uh, uh, have complicated storage setup, start with things as simple as possible, maybe just storage in the cloud. Uh, so to highlight again some of these things, uh, here is a, a use case with uh, ZF. Uh, ZF actually has a heritage in uh, the Zeppelin airships. Uh, you probably will recall the airship that uh, went up in flames so spectacularly in 1937 in uh, Lakehurst in New Jersey. 
Uh, nowadays, uh, ZF is actually doing, is a large automotive uh, technology provider and industrial technology provider. Uh, they are a customer of Altairs for other things. What they do in the cloud context is they scale out machine learning for autonomous driving. Um, so they have uh, on-prem a CI CD uh, environment that is based on uh, Kubernetes. And then when they scale out to do model training, uh, they want to do it in the cloud and they actually want to do it uh, uh, with uh, Azure and AWS. Um, so when we did the POC with them, uh, we actually started uh, really with a cloud only uh, uh, setup and uh, then also only on one of the cloud providers and added the other capabilities step by step and this really delivered a good experience. So then as you uh, go into a production, uh, one of the key things is obviously cost and you do need software that provides cost control, which our software uh, does. Uh, and another key thing is really to automate as much as you can. So this could be the right sizing of instances. Uh, this also comes down if you wanna save cost uh, and you wanna use spot instances that you uh, have to reallocate uh, spot instances all the time because they are not dependable. Uh, uh, so, uh, and also when you scale out and scale down, you have to do that with the highest amount of automation that you have available. Uh, again, to walk you through some of the things here with the use case. Uh, so Foundation Medicine is a really interesting company. They do uh, cancer gene analytics uh, for optimized treatment. What that means is, so doctors will send them probes of cancer tissue, which then gets genetically analyzed. They actually have big farms of PCR machines and the output of the PCR machines is then sent to next generation sequence pipelines uh, that are uh, uh, running in the cloud on demand. Uh, uh, so the whole setup is really fully automated and policy controlled. Uh, it needs to scale to whatever capacity is needed in terms of the analytics that need to be done. So for instance, if they get a probe, they actually have to get back with a result within 24 hours, or otherwise they have to discard uh, the result. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, there's this very restrictive environment and has to be highly automated. They currently are using uh, eight clusters in the cloud in different geos, uh, are currently using about 80,000 cores, and they're targeting 1 million as they actually grow the company. Another area is around the, uh, using spot instances for saving cost and using uh, fleet capabilities to scale out and scale down. Uh, so uh, a customer that we have here is uh, petroleum gas services. If you're not into uh, oil and gas industry, then you might not know them, but they're actually a huge provider uh, of services, big data services, basically for the oil and gas industry. Uh, their use cases, they need to be, uh, go to extreme scaling levels, but very quickly, they do not wanna pay for the ramp up time. Uh, so the, within minutes, you have to get to uh, clusters of thousands of nodes uh, and they use uh, spot instances for that exclusively. So they need to do a rapid scale up using spot fleet. Uh, the scale up is actually relatively easy. The scale down is much, much more tricky because you do not want to shut down uh, work, uh, instances that still do work. So that's actually much more tricky to figure out. Um, now, in uh, all of our, uh, uh, you know, uh, cloud deployments that we have done, there is a number of lessons that we have learned and I didn't want to pack uh, the previous slides too much. So I'm listing them here and I walk you through them one by one uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what we learned and what type of use cases are aligned with it. So the first one about utilizing configuration management. Uh, so uh, we already have discussed uh, the Johnson & Johnson Jensen uh, use case and the Foundation Medicine use case. Uh, in these use cases, one of them used configuration management the previously to going to the cloud. The other one didn't. And, uh, you know, the difference was night and day. Uh, the one who used configuration management uh, had a much easier road to travel than uh, uh, the other one. I will not tell you who is who. But uh, if you plan on going to the cloud, uh, do consider using configuration management for your cluster, uh, you know, deployment. So as you update clusters uh, or install clusters, use configuration management for that. 
that makes it infinitely easier uh, to do cloud management. Of course, you need to pick a cloud management solution that can interface with your configuration management with our software does with any. I mean, you can use whatever you want, Ansible, SaltStack, uh, Chef Puppet, you, na you name it. Uh, but that makes it a lot easier. Uh, next thing is uh, total cost of ownership. So here's a nice example uh, by Wharton School of Business. Uh, so they are a school of business. Uh, the use case uh, was they needed GPU access and they were thinking about should we buy GPU access for on-prem or should we be uh, renting them in the cloud? So as a school of business, they did a sophisticated cost analysis. Uh, of course, they did the usual thing. Well, for what percentage of time will I need it and stuff like that. But they also did, did some more interesting stuff. So for instance, if I buy GPUs today, uh, you know, uh, uh, latest model, then they are only the latest model for like half a year, right? And uh, they get basically worse and worse in comparative performance uh, over time. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, they, they looked at what can I get out of the devices that I rent uh, and what does that cost me versus, uh, uh, you know, what would it cost me on, uh, on prem? Um, so, uh, uh, and basically for them, uh, cloud came out, out equal or slightly better at the time. Uh, as time moved on, they actually have been shifting more and more weight to the cloud and they are now predominantly uh, using cloud. You should also anticipate uh, cloud footprint growth and that, that can actually go really rapidly. Uh, we have seen that time and again. So an example is 3M, uh, definitely don't need introduction. Uh, so they actually started using cloud and finance, uh, but then they moved some of the data that also HPC used along the lines uh, to the cloud. So they were considering uh, using cloud also uh, for HPC, uh, first for peak usage only. And as they did this, uh, they realized, hey, our uh, on-prem cloud resources actually don't get utilized as much anymore. So they get kind of more expensive, if you will. Uh, currently now, the uh, cloud actually dominates for them in terms of HPC, while uh, they only run peak loads on-prem nowadays. So they have really cut down on on-prem usage. Uh, bare metal can make sense, uh, specifically if you have an infinibend dependent jobs. A good example is uh, this use case here. It's an automotive supplier in Southern Europe. I cannot share the name. Uh, but they do energy efficient powertrains. So they use multi-cloud, uh, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure and Google Cloud Platform. And the reason is, uh, well, they have applications that require infinite band and other applications that don't. Uh, so they opted for running the applications that require infinite band on Oracle Cloud, uh, while uh, they run the other applications on Google Cloud. And the reason is that uh, Oracle uh, uh, offers a better deal in terms of uh, uh, bare metal and InfiniBand uh, than the others do. Uh, it's worthwhile to note that this is all run from a single on-prem PBS uh, cluster. So they have on-prem work as well. But you know they burst from a single on-prem PBS cluster. For, so for the end user, there's no difference. Uh, and they do not necessarily know something ran on Oracle and something else ran on Google or on-prem. Uh, it also can make a lot of sense to use multiple availability zones and then load balance across them. So there's an example of a renewable energy equipment supplier in Northern Europe. Again, I cannot share uh, their name and logo. Uh, but they uh, have been uh, using uh, spot instances, again, to save cost. So they need specific spot instances and want to get them for a specific price. And uh, it, it, it so happens that uh, you quickly may run out of uh, spot instance of those types in the availability zone if you only use one. So they have been using multiple availability zones and are kind of uh, round robining it uh, through those availability zones to harvest as many spot instances as they uh, could. Another interesting aspect of them is they have a mix of Windows and Linux uh, uh, systems in the cloud, which is actually relatively rare. We don't see that all that often. Final uh, use case basically is uh, highlighting that data migration can be crucial. Uh, so we have uh, seen that, for instance, uh, obviously also with other uh, 
uh, use cases, but for instance, with NVIDIA, more specifically the Mellanix uh, uh, subsidiary, they obviously don't need introduction uh, here. Uh, so their uh, uh, target use case was to avoid bottlenecks during uh, peak tape out period. So during basically uh, 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 creating uh, the uh, uh, latest uh, 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 touches on the designs for the next uh, NVIDIA, uh, sorry, uh, Mellanox chips. Uh, so uh, what they did then, of course, is uh, uh, scaling out to the cloud uh, with uh, capacity on demand. Um, but they needed automated data migration to and from the cloud for that, uh, which we had established for them. Another interesting aspect that they had is, uh, like all chip uh, design industries, uh, they use uh, chip design tools, and that software is extremely expensive. There can be many hundred thousand dollars per seat, per single seat. Uh, so it's most important that you just use that, uh, you know, single uh, or those licenses that you have available. And uh, if you can get other work out of the way, uh, then you will do so. And for instance, they are using cloud for that purpose. So they basically have a smaller set of on-prem resources, but they're entirely busy uh, with you know, those, uh, consuming those expensive licenses while uh, software that is not, or, or uh, applications that are not uh, requiring licenses are run in the cloud. So that's all the use cases. So in terms of uh, final words, uh, just some summary. Uh, you can actually move uh, an entire HPC infrastructure or a large part of it in the cloud that is thoroughly possible uh, today. And we have done it many times. Uh, cost remains a concern, of course. <clears throat> so you definitely need to have cost control in place, uh, which again, our products provide, but also things like uh, spot support, uh, what most of our customers actually do is uh, hybrids, so they still utilize uh, uh, hybrid uh, for uh, you know cost efficiency, where that makes the most sense. While they do use cloud uh, for specific use cases, uh, then brownfield brownfield readiness is a must. What I mean by this is. Uh, uh, so never use a cloud application or a cloud migration strategy that basically tells you you have to change everything how you do HPC. That is not necessary. You can actually uh, continue to do HPC as you have always done. Uh, you just need uh, a cloud management uh, infrastructure and environment that allows you to get you know, your images into the system, to get your identity management integrated, your networking, your security. And that is absolutely possible. Uh, then automation is key. I've talked about this in a number of slides. Uh, you know, for instance, the policy-driven uh, rapid scaling, uh, storage and data locality are crucial. We've just talked about this uh, regarding Mellanox. Uh, so you uh, need to have multiple ways of doing cloud storage integration, and then also automated data migration, which we provide as well. And my final uh, word really, really is. Uh, uh, make sure you utilize a structured approach for the cloud migration. I've talked about the step-by-step -step approach. I've talked about using things like configuration uh, management. The more structured you go about your cloud journey, the more, uh, uh, the better your experience will be. Uh, so with that, uh, with this slide, I have just assembled a few more pieces of information. Uh, you know, if you, uh, you need further detail, and uh, I'll leave this slide up for just a minute or two uh, while we take uh, questions. And uh, I'll uh, thank you for your attention thus far. Thank you, um, Fritz. We'll wait for some of the questions to come, but uh, it seems like it's a bit slow. Um, so because we, we, we've got some of Chris's questions, um, that came through a bit late. So I think the questions for you is also going to be a bit late. So if we maybe can wait till maybe, I think quarter past or just if, uh, quarter past one as it comes through, because the previous okay. questions was, um, the previous questions was for Chris. Um, Chris is still here, he can take a question. While we wait, uh, is Crystal here? No, I think Chris left already. 
think Chris left already. The questions to Chris was, uh, um, I'm, I'm not going to answer Chris's questions. <laughs> no, I, I just want to put it on to record as part of this uh, uh, recording. Yeah, the questions to Chris was, uh, this might sound silly, uh, like a silly question, but if you if I listen, the disadvantage seems to be far outweigh the benefits of IoT. So my question is simple: Why should I have IoT? Second question was: If you are interested in supporting small developers with limited budget, are you considering open source software options? I'm not sure whether it was targeted at Chris or yourself, Fritz. If you're interested in targeting small developers with limited budget, uh, um, are you considering open source software options? Was that a question uh, to me? Uh, if you are, Chris. I think that's to Chris. Rotation, third question is rotation in opposite direction for, okay, that is also Chris question. Rotation in opposite directions for routers. Router this um, um router advantages. If uh, router slightly off panel would this have an, an advantage? It was for Chris, and those were some of the just the general questions targeted at Chris. We're still waiting for your questions um to come through, and I think that will normally come through a little bit later because of the system being delayed. Well, you can always, uh, I mean, I'm not sure how you would communicate them my answer back to uh, those asking a question, but uh, I mean, you can always forward the question to me by email or similar and I'll, I'll happily provide an answer. Okay, that can work. Um, if we have any other questions, um, I think there's a 15 second, 15 could be a little bit more, but not too much. So delaying the questions, yeah. So, I think we've got five more minutes and we'll wait a few more minutes and we'll, okay, to see if there is going to be questions coming through. Um, I think Chris, um, Fritz, from the, from the experience we have, um, you, and, and, and it's exactly what you share with us is that some companies, because cloud is really new, but the implementation of, of cloud computing is saturated to a certain group of companies. You broke up for me. You broke up for me quite a bit. I said, although cloud is not new, the actual um, um, implementation of cloud applications with this hardware or software, it, it, it's a little bit saturated, not too saturated, but targeted at a few different um, bigger companies that is doing cloud. And if you look at um, cloud from a developer perspective, so I'm actually- Webcast support is, uh, is it Rick's audio? Something is, hang on, let me just try and see. I think your, your, I've lost your, My connectivity is fine. Oh, there you go. I think it's your connectivity first. Okay, Chris. Um, Fritz. Okay, I can see you moving, but I can't hear you. I didn't say anything. <laughs> oh, okay. You didn't say anything. So I think also coming back to the question it was posted for the HPC hardware. I think a lot of the, the smaller developers, um, when it comes to cloud and the bigger um, development beyond cloud, um, there is not a lot of support for smaller developers because of the, the application itself and the targeted itself. Um, do out there or even in your space, do you make provision for maybe smaller developers or integrate to smaller applications? 
Yeah, it depends a bit on what you mean by developer. So uh, we have uh, Altair One, which basically is a, a software as a service environment. Uh, so if you are a engineer that, for instance, uh, you know, uh, uh, engineers, uh, uh, let's say mechanical parts, or uh, you know, does optimization of uh, you know, let's say something like an aircraft or whatever, you know, uh, electronic devices, stuff like that. We actually have a. Uh, uh, a service that uh, where you can uh, log in and get access to the applications and run them on the cloud. You can also get something that we call a virtual appliance, which is basically a cluster for you, which is no touch. So you don't need to do your own administration. You get the uh, readily installed cluster together with a workload management system, together with uh, uh, some application software uh, you might choose, and then you know run your uh, work and uh, you know, get it shut down afterwards. So that does not require you to be an IT expert of any shape or form. You just use your application that you want. So those types of things are possible. Um, if it comes to you know software development, that's not necessarily something uh, that we address. So you can use our our workload management systems, of course, for uh, software. Uh, development uh, purposes as well, uh, but you know that's usually larger uh, types of uh, scenarios. Okay, I think um, um, uh, 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 there's no questions coming through, and uh, again, I might think it might be delayed again, and then it might come through later on. But if there is any um, no questions, there's no questions yet. Um, maybe if there is any, we will. I think Kevin, we can just see if we can get your um, the questions to you. Alternatively, we can send your detail to the respective person if they leave an email or something. But I think your um, details is already in on the front of the presentation itself. So when they go to look at the recording, and they might be able to post a question directly to you. Fritz, with that being said, thank you very much. Um, for your presentation. It's again, a significant um, area for us, uh, especially from a developing world. Um, and especially now during pandemic times, because for example, a lot of developed countries might not be able to afford, um, or even um, organizations might not be able to afford the broad architecture behind the cloud itself. And I think from that perspective, we know and we've got some options um, based on what you've presented on the use cases, um, especially for data recording in this pandemic environment uh, from a developer perspective and, how, and also from the different types of industries in these environments and how to support them and where to, or possibly um, get some sort of direction what we want to achieve if it is a case where cloud computing is required thank you very much for your input i hope you guys are gonna have a much more rewarding winter and looking forward to the summer stay safe on that side and stay so thank you very much for us yeah thank you for uh, giving uh this time and uh, have a great holiday as well. Yeah, it will, it, this is definitely one of those um, presentations that we will go back to at some point. Thank you very much. I think with that, um, if there's any questions that's going to follow, you can contact um, Fritz directly. His details is at the start of the um, recording. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we conclude the presentation. Sure. Thank you. Back to technical support. Cheers.